We know it's possible because it has happened that there are a variety of historical societies in which law did not come from the state. Uh, I think there are institutions possible uh, where law, I would have said rights enforcement and dispute settlement, which is really what law amounts to, are provided in a private and decentralized way and that that could give you a mechanism for generating good law. And it's not at all clear whether the system we now have works for that purpose. That's sort of my standard counterexample is that the economics of foreign trade were worked out by David Ricardo just about 200 years ago. And his analysis, uh, what's called the theory of comparative advantage, has been pretty much accepted by serious economists ever since, despite which almost no country acts in the way that that implies. That basically the implication of the standard economic analysis is that with certain special exceptions, a country that imposes tariffs is shooting itself in the foot. It's making its own people worse off. Nonetheless, almost all countries in the world have tariffs. And I take that as some evidence against the idea that our present mechanisms produce good law. Uh, and in fact, the law that we do have, to some extent, is privately produced, uh, both in that it's developed over a period of time out of systems uh, in which a good deal of the legal rules were coming either from norms, which are a form of private law after all, ordinary social norms, uh, or from things like uh, private arbitration decisions in the, the, the fair courts of medieval Europe. Uh, but I also think, also even in the modern system, uh, there is a private organization which essentially gives its view of the implications of the common law tradition, American Law Institute, and to a considerable extent state uh, legislatures adopt its doctrines uh, as their law. So a good deal of law is in various ways privately produced, a good deal of it isn't. Uh, and I sketched in my first book uh, a set of institutions in which it was entirely private, both law and law enforcement, and offered reasons to think that that would have internal reasons to try to produce good law, to try to produce law people liked being under. Uh, and I don't think that is true or not nearly as much true of the kind of democratic legislative institutions that we, we now have. So I think it's a good idea uh, if one can manage it. Because from this, the mechanism that in theory controls a democratic state is majority voting. The problem is that each individual voter has no incentive to be well informed about who he should vote for. That politicians never say, I'm the bad guy. Uh, they have never introduced a bill to Congress titled, a bill to make farmers richer and city folks poorer, even though they routinely do introduce such a bill. It's called the Farm Program, and it's generally its purpose is to make uh, agricultural products more expensive in order to raise the income of farmers, uh, get their votes at the expense of everybody else. So that means that in order for a voter to know that this congressman has supported a good law, he would first have to have followed how the congressman voted, which almost nobody bothers to do, and second, he would have to disentangle the arguments of people who said it was a good law from the arguments of people who said it was a bad law to figure out which were right. All of that would involve uh, a good deal of expertise and a good deal of time and effort, and there's no incentive to do it. If you're an individual voter at the presidential level, you know that your vote has something like maybe a one chance in five million of determining the outcome of the election. It's only if it's an absolute knife-edge election. Less than that for me, because I'm in California, where if California is a swing state in the presidential election, the Republicans won, because it's a very democratic state. Uh, so that means there's no incentive to, and therefore people don't. That I, Back when I was teaching an undergraduate class uh, some years back, I would sometimes ask the students if they knew the name of their congressman, and about half of them did. So it's very hard to follow what someone's doing if you don't know his name. Uh, so that means that the voters are rationally ignorant, that they vote on the basis either of free information, of what they see on television, which is very low quality information, on what their friends say, on what position will make them popular with their friends, things like that. Uh, then you have a second mechanism which does work, and that's special interest politics. 
because if you are part of an interest group which will gain or lose a lot by some particular legislation, if you are uh, a steel executive and the question is, shall we have a tariff to keep out foreign steel, you know that you can spend enough resources to actually influence the outcome by making campaign contributions and such and by uh, arranging with the union that represents your workers to tell their people to vote for the people who will support the steel tariff. Uh, so you can have a noticeable influence. Also, much more is at stake for you because you get a large part of the gain from that, that law. Uh, you will therefore be willing to contribute much larger resources to getting the law you want than the people who are injured by the law, even if their total injury is much larger. Because the people who are injured by a steel tariff is basically everybody else. It's everybody who consumes goods that have steel as an input, and it's all producers of export goods, because if we import less, we'll export less. So that's a very dispersed interest group. There's no way that they are going to get together to coordinate in order to stop the tariff. So you've got law, which is where the basic pattern, I think, is that you tend to benefit concentrated and organized groups at the expense of disorganized groups. And you tend to do things which sound good if you don't think about them. That is to do things where there's no information cost, but those are often things where what you're, the information you're getting isn't true. Uh, so if I go back to the case of foreign trade, the popular view of foreign trade in which when we put up a tariff we are benefiting ourselves at the expense of the country we have a tariff against, which is more or less the view before Ricardo, the 18th century mercantilist view, is much easier to understand than the correct view. Just as a, the view of astronomy in which the earth was at the center and everything ro rotated around it was much easier to understand than the Coper Copernican view that we now believe is true. Uh, well, if you have no in incentive to actually know the right answer, uh, the one that sounds plausible and easy is the one you're going to adopt. So I think that's the pattern we get. Sometimes it gives you the right answer. Sometimes the easy argument is actually a correct argument, but very often it isn't. Uh, so I think that's why you get bad law out of democratic institutions. In principle, hereditary monarchy could do better on the grounds that the king not only wants his country to prosper so he can collect taxes and live well, he wants it to keep prospering so his son can. But in practice, hereditary monarchy has the problem that there's no reason to expect that the ruler is the person most qualified to rule. Furthermore, hereditary monarchies are a lot less stable than they pretend to be. My younger son, whose interest is historical, likes to point out that England if I remember correctly, his claim never went more than about two monarchs without some conflict over who was going to be king. Uh, so it doesn't really work very well either. So I don't really know of any system, of any governmental system. I suppose the best system is benevolent dictatorship if you just happen to get the right dictator. So that uh, England, as you may know, had a military dictator for about 10 or 20 years uh, in the 17th century, a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, that England had two successive civil wars, and the first one was Parliament against the King, and that was won by the New Model Army, largely under Oliver Cromwell. The second was the New Model Army against everybody else, and that was won by the New Model Army under Cromwell. And Cromwell then made himself military dictator of England for the rest of his life. And my impression is he did a pretty good job. He seems to have been pretty competent. Uh, there's a historical novel about ancient Greece by Mary Renault, who is an, no longer alive, but she was a very good historical novelist. And part of what that one is about is the Greek sense of the word tyrant. And a tyrant was not a negative term in, 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 in the Greek usage. It basically meant a popular dictator. And she has portraits in that, in that one, which is called The Praise Singer, it's a good book, uh, of three different tyrants. And uh, one of them three different tyrannies, really. And one of them, the tyrant, is corrupt but competent. And in order for him to do well, his island has to do well. So when he dies, he's not a very nice person, but when he dies, things get much worse. One of them, the tyrant, is actually benevolent, and he does quite a good job, but then he dies, and his sons take over, and it runs sort of on, on momentum for a little while and then slides down. Uh, so, so I don't think there is a good mechanism, uh, other than being lucky, so to speak. Uh, whereas we do have a variety of contexts in which rules are made privately that 
a whole lot of the rules that actually apply to people are rules that come out of contracts that people have entered into, and I, they, they're largely free to set the terms they like, and I think that, that works a good deal better. Uh, private norms are really a system of decentralized, privately enforced law, where the enforcement is people not talking to you if you behave in the way they don't like, and things of that sort. So anyway, so it, it does seem to me that, that, that legislation is not a very effective way of getting good law and that there are better solutions. And as I say, if people are interested, if you read my book, The Machinery of Freedom, which you can read for free if you're satisfied with the second edition, which is up on my webpage as a PDF, and you can read the third edition as a fairly inexpensive Kindle or print book from Amazon. And part three of that, I try to sketch out an imaginary future society along the technological lines of the one we've now got. So it's, it's not a science fiction in that sense, but one in which all rights enforcement and dispute settlement is private, done on a competitive market. And my most recent book is one called Legal Systems Very Different from Ours, in which I tried to make sense of a whole lot of different, different legal systems. Uh, my basic assumption was that all human societies face about the same problems. They solve them in an interesting variety of different ways, and they're all grown-ups. So you should take all of them seriously and try to learn from them. And I concluded that in my first book, I had been reinventing the wheel because I discovered that there are a variety of real-world societies, a good deal more primitive than ours, so with less fancy institutions, in which law and law enforcement were private and decentralized. And as far as I can tell, they didn't work noticeably worse than the other ones around which it wasn't. Uh, so that was sort of interesting, to going back to discover what had actually existed after theorizing about it, whatever it was, 40 years earlier. No. Uh, my view on moral philosophy was more or less a result of losing an argument to Isaiah Berlin, who was a philosopher who was visiting Harvard when I was a student there. And prior to that, my view was that moral beliefs were just tastes, that the fact that I thought that murdering people was bad was sort of like the fact that I liked chocolate ice cream and didn't like strawberry ice cream. And Berlin persuaded me that that was not as defensible a position as I thought. And he did it, interestingly enough, not really by arguing that our moral beliefs have better foundations than I thought, but that our factual beliefs have weaker foundations. That if you ask, how do I know that the real world is out there and is what I perceive? Well, I can't prove it. It's always possible that I'm a brain in a vat being fed information by a computer somewhere. Or it, We, in fact, know that in certain ways the physical world is not what we perceive. That uh, I got a doctorate in physics before I went on to do economics. And there are facts in both relativity and quantum mechanics which are clearly impossible in terms of our intuition uh, about how the world works. That relativity tells us that velocities don't add that if, if you imagine that you're in a train that's going 50 miles an hour and uh, you throw a ball ahead of you at 20 miles an hour, it seems obvious that from the standpoint of people outside the train, the ball is moving at 70 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour plus 20. It isn't true. It turns out that if you work out relativity, uh, that if you are moving at six-tenths of the speed of light, and you project something ahead of you that's also at six tenths of the speed of light, it will be moving at a speed well below the speed of light. And there are reasons, and eventually you can figure out why your intuition was wrong, that you had things that seemed perfectly obvious to you that weren't true. For those who know, know relativity, you thought simultaneity was well-defined and isn't. Similarly with quantum mechanics, we, in effect, roughly speaking, we know it is possible for a single electron to go through two different slits and interfere with itself. We know that it is possible for a particle to get from point A to point B when in between there, there is a barrier that, 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 that such that in order to be in that barrier, it would have to have negative energy. It can't get there. So there are a variety of respects in which we actually know the world is not what we think it is, although at a gross level, I, I think my perceptions are reasonably accurate. So Berlin's point was, why are we so sure about the real world? And his answer was basically because our test of our beliefs about the real world passes those tests we can impose on it, which are mainly consistency. The question is, how do I know there isn't a lion, a tiger sitting on top of this table? 
Well, I not only don't see one, I don't smell one, I don't feel one, you don't get up and run away as you would if you saw one. So all the things I can see, I have a consistent picture, that's as good a test as we can get. And Berlin argued that we have that, that same test for moral beliefs if you take them at a primitive enough level. That if you take factual beliefs at a sophisticated level, where the question is, uh, is the climate getting warmer in ways that will make us much worse off? People disagree about that. If you ask, is the climate getting warmer, most people agree about that, although some disagree. If you ask, does this match burn me, when I put the flame under me, everybody agrees. <laughs> so it's uh, at the sort of level of direct sense experiences, as it were, we have almost complete unanimity. And Berlin's argument was that the equivalent level for that on moral beliefs is not complicated situations. It's sort of well-described, simple situations where most people have the same moral response. And this, I still remember the argument he gave was, you, you meet somebody who goes around sticking pins in people. And you say, why are you sticking pins in people? And he says, well, I like the feeling of a pin going into a resilient object. And you say, ah, that's it, is it? Here's a rubber ball. Why don't you stick your pin in that? Oh, thank you. That, that's much more convenient. They don't scream and, and hit me. And he goes away sticking pins into rubber balls. And Berlin's point was that people disagree on the details of morality, but the idea that whether you hurt somebody is completely irrelevant, that sticking a pin in a person is no different from sticking in a rubber ball, is so far out of our perception of moral views that we see the guy as crazy. So that was an interesting argument. I think he was probably at least convincing, maybe correct. So since then, I've tended to take a position which I sometimes describe as Catholicism without God, in the sense that I think moral statements are true or false. They are not deducible from physical statements. I agree with Hume that you, there is a division between is and ought, but nonetheless they are perceived in some way, just as I don't, well, I have some idea of how my eyesight works. People 300 years ago didn't, but they still believe their eyes. And I don't know how we perceive moral beliefs. And it's possible that they're an illusion. It's possible I'm fooling myself. But it seems to me that, that, that the world fits the pattern of there is some set of true moral statements. Everybody imperfectly perceives them, except for a few people who are crazy. We call them psychopaths. Uh, and that, so that's my view on, on, on morality. But beyond that, it doesn't seem to me that moral philosophy has got, made much progress in the last few thousand years. Uh, so when I argue for libertarian views, I don't try to argue on moral grounds because I don't think I can prove to other people that my moral beliefs are true. I try to say, all right, we share the following moral beliefs. Here is why, in terms of those shared beliefs, the outcomes of my system are better than the alternatives. All right, I don't think I've met any socialists who agree with me about how socialism works and how capitalism works, but are in favor of socialism. And I'm not sure I know any libertarians who agree with socialists the other way around and are in favor of, of markets. So I think you can, in principle and largely in practice, you can settle political disputes without getting into the moral issues. We all feel the moral issues, and certainly a good deal of what we actually do is affected by them, that part of the reason why I'm upset about, upset about government doing certain things or people doing certain things is it feels wrong to me. But I can't convince you of that if it doesn't feel wrong to you, but I can convince you, uh, let's take the war on drugs, all right? It seems to me that it's morally wrong for me to tell you you can't shoot up if you want to. It's your body, not mine. A lot of people don't agree with that. But if I can persuade them that the actual effect of the war on drugs is bad, that the effect on the, that 95% that of the bad effects of drug addiction are due to its being illegal and only 5% due to its being bad, uh, that's a good reason why they should want to legalize it, uh, whether or not they agree with my morals. So I think that's true across the board. So the argument I make for private for, for market anarchy, for anarcho-capitalism, is not that government actions are wicked, it is that government actions make us worse off. Uh, and therefore you could have a more attractive society without a government. The idea that uh, rights are simple and clear and therefore you can uh, eliminate everything by, uh, you can solve all problems by showing you can't do that because it violates rights. Uh, and some of those, I guess my favorite uh, counter to that, uh, which comes from Bill Bradford, who was the editor of Liberty Magazine, he's no longer alive unfortunately, but he was an interesting guy, uh, and he says, all right, you, this is my memory of his example, 
uh, you happen to be on fall off your balcony on the 15th floor of an apartment building, unfortunately. But fortunately, there's a flagpole uh, coming off the balcony on the 14th floor just below you, and you manage to grab hold of that. It doesn't break, and you're going hand over hand back to the 14th floor balcony to get on it and get down. When the owner of that apartment comes uh, out of his comes onto his balcony and he says that flagpole is my property, not yours. Let go. Do you? Well, if the answer is that you don't, we have to either say that's because you're a bad person, you've just violated his rights, or you have to say uh, it is morally legitimate to violate rights when enough is at stake, which is basically what this comes to. But once you've conceded that it's morally right to, to violate rights when enough is at stake, now you've abandoned the moral argument against almost everything. Because somebody who's in favor of the military draft will say, well, without the draft we couldn't defeat the Nazis and we would have all been ended up as Nazi slaves, so enough was at stake, so it was right. Uh, and that's going to be true of almost anything, that, that people can always make an argument of that sort. And you've got to face the consequential argument uh, once you abandon the moral argument. That would, be, that would be the simplest example, but you can think of a lot of other examples that the whole problem of property rights, in land in particular, is how did you get that property right? You didn't create the land. Uh, I've got a chapter in Machinery of Freedom where I try to sketch out a possible moral justification for property rights, but it's a fairly hard job. But the practical justification is that we are all much better off in a world where people own stuff than where they don't. If the land is commons, nobody can use it for anything. Slight exaggeration, but they can't use it for many of the things we would like to use land for. Uh, so in general, I think that that's the case. But it's true not just among libertarians that uh, one of the arguments I've gotten into over the last decade or so is the whole uh, global warming climate change. And what irritates me is that the people who are critical of the current orthodoxy generally base their criticism on criticizing the strongest part of it rather than the weakest part. That they try to argue that global climate is not going, temperature is not going up, when I think there's pretty good evidence that it is. They try to argue it's not due to human action, and they, there are a few of them who are sophisticated enough to correctly say climate is a very complicated system, Lots of things could affect it, lots of things have affected it in the past. We can't be sure how much of it is due to human action. But the physics of the greenhouse effect are pretty straightforward. So it's clear that you would expect increased CO2 to raise the temperature of the Earth, and people make very bad, uninformed arguments on why that isn't true. Uh, but the weak part of the orthodoxy is the consequences. Because if you think about the issue for a little, you realize that warming has both good and bad effects. It's not at all clear which are larger that people make a whole lot of fuss about the fact that as summers get hotter, more people die from hot summers. That's perfectly true. But there is an old article in The Lancet, a British, a respectable British medical magazine, where they tried to estimate globally deaths from cold versus deaths from heat. And it turns out that deaths from cold are something like 20 times as large as deaths from heat. And that when you raise average temperature, you on the whole make winters milder as well as summers hotter. So that's a case where my guess, though it's hard to be sure because we don't know exactly how either thing responds, but my guess is that total mortality from temperature goes down when you get warmer, not up, but everybody pays attention to it's going up. And there are other examples. That is, there, I've had a, lots of arguments on this over the years. But my basic point is that, that if you want to argue against the current orthodoxy, the argument you want to make is there's no good reason to think that warming is a bad thing, let alone a catastrophically bad thing, rather than trying to criticize the strong parts of it, which is that warming exists, and it's at least in large part due to human action. So that would be an example outside of, of libertarianism. I think it's true in lots of, lots of other contexts that, that it is tempting to make a sort of... It's tempting to do what Trump does, to be a demagogue, and it works for politicians sometimes. Trump is a very able demagogue, unfortunately. Uh, but that in the long term, I think you're better off if you try to only say things that are true. Uh, and part of the reason is that once you accept the idea of stretching the truth for a good cause, it becomes harder and harder to find out what the truth is. Because almost not, all, I think all of us base our opinions mostly on secondhand information. If I go back to climate for a moment, a professional climate scientist is basing his opinions mostly on secondhand information because no one person knows enough 
that he didn't read the, collect the data that told him what the temperature was 100 years ago. Uh, he didn't do the, develop the uh, thermodynamics that was the uh, physical basis for understanding uh, what affects global temperature and all the rest of it. He's done one small part of the job, the job, and relies on that. Well, if when he does that small job, he sometimes gets a result which makes it look as though global warming isn't a big problem. But he doesn't publish that because he knows that global warming is a problem. He doesn't want to give people the wrong idea. And when he gets something the other side, he does publish it. And everybody else is doing that. Then he is basing his distortion of truth on what he assumes to be true but isn't from everybody else. And I think that can happen even with nobody deliberately dishonest. I'm sure that in most of these controversies, some people are deliberately dishonest. But my guess is that most of them aren't. Uh, but everybody, not everybody, but most people tweak what they say uh, in the direction of what they want other people to believe and enough of that adds up and you end up believing things that aren't true. So I think it's a good general rule to try to only make arguments that after thinking about it, you are reasonably sure are correct. The argumentation ethics from what I've seen makes no sense at all. Uh, I would have said that self-ownership makes sense in two quite different senses. In a moral sense, because it's my moral intuition, it seems to me wrong for you to claim you own me. But as a practical sense, I can move my hand very, very low cost. I just tell it to move. You can move my hand only by grabbing it and wrestling with me or maybe pointing a gun at me and ordering me to move my hand. So the costs of me controlling me are much lower than the costs of you controlling me. Uh, and that, it seems to me, is a pretty strong practical argument for rules under which I control me instead of you controlling me. Uh, and then there's the further argument insofar as what matters is my interest, which isn't the only thing that matters, it's what matters to me at least largely. I'm much more likely to know what's in my interest than you are to know what's in my interest. Not always true, you might happen to have some expert information, but it's a way to bet. And you, I've got a much stronger incentive to act in my interest than you do to act in my interest. So I think that there's a lot to be said for the general intuition that a world where people control themselves is likely to be a world in which people get the things they want to end up with more than a world in which they don't. So I say you can make, and I, I don't want to understate the moral argument because I certainly intuit it. I certainly do feel as though slavery is wrong and even modest forms of slavery such as saying that a a uh, cake shop is obliged to bake a cake for a gay wedding even if the proprietor does, is against gay marriage. That strikes me as it's a very watered-down form of slavery, but nonetheless saying you've got to do this not because you're willing to do it in a voluntary way because we make you do it, it's, it seems to me has got a, a touch of slavery. That feels morally wrong to me, and it feels morally wrong even if it's on my side. So that I would say that saying that a private university can't discriminate against libertarians in its hiring policy would be wrong. I would say it shouldn't. It would be foolish for it to do so. Maybe it's dishonest if it claims it isn't doing so and, and, and is. I think that my alma mater, Harvard, is pretty clearly dishonest about its student admissions policies. It's reasonably clear that they discriminate against East Asian students uh, just as uh, quite a long time ago they and other universities discriminated against Jewish students. And I should say probably for the same reason. I don't think it's that they're prejudiced against East Asians or even that they were prejudiced against Jews, but that you have a population which does much better at the measures that they're using to admit people than most of the population. And for one reason or another, they don't want to have a student body which is 40% Chinese or 50% or Jewish if you go back, whatever, 800 years or so, whatever. Yeah, be about, it. not 800, sorry, 80 years or so back when the, when the, elite universities were trying to keep down the number of Jews enrolling. Uh, but anyway, so, so it seems to me that they're allowed to do that. They should be allowed to do that. They aren't allowed under current law to do that. But it's nonetheless something they shouldn't do. Uh, and so in that sense, my, my uh, moral intuition about individual freedom includes freedom to do things I disapprove of, which many people for some reasons do. Uh, Sure. Let me go back a step to say what, what, to my mind, market failure is. I think market failure describes situations where individual rationality does not produce group rationality. Where each, even if each individual correctly decides what action is in his interest to take, the net result is that many people, or perhaps everybody, are worse off than they've done something else. 
And my standard example of that is an army running away. That is one of my favorite examples is in one of my books. You imagine that you're part of a line of 10,000 men with spears. This is a thousand years ago or so. And they're all pointing that way because coming at you are another 10,000 men on horseback with spears. And you do a quick cost-benefit calculation and you say if we all stand and keep our spears planted, with luck we can break their charge. And some of us will die, but most of us will live. If we run, horses run faster than we do. I should stand. And that's a mistake. And it's a mistake because I don't control the guy on either side of me. I only control me. If they run and I stand, I'm dead. If they stand and I run, I might get away. I've got a better chance. My running will have a very small effect on whether we stop the charge because there are 10,000. I'm only one person. But a relatively large effect on whether I survive it. Everybody does that calculation. We all run and most of us die. Welcome to the dark side of rationality. So that's a nice dramatic example, but it, the problem exists in lots and lots of other contexts. The one I encounter, encounter pretty, pretty commonly is how noisy restaurants and bars are. I don't encounter it in bars because I don't go in bars much, but restaurants. Because what's happening, it's a, there's a little bit of noise, so you've got to raise your voice so your friends can hear you. Everybody else then has to raise their voice, and it keeps going up. And you'd all be better off if you all spoke reasonably softly, but you end up noisy enough, in the, at least in the case of the bar kind of environment I've very occasionally been in, so nobody can hear anybody. Uh, so in government, uh, the problem, which I discussed earlier and a bit you may or may not have cut by now, uh, is that the individual actors in government are not bearing the costs, uh, the net costs of their actions. So if you want people to, to, if you want individual rationality to lead to group rationality, you need some mechanism such that when I take an action, I bear most of the net costs. I get the benefits or, and pay the costs. And on the market, that's mostly true, though not perfectly true. Uh, ordinary private market. But in the political market, it's almost never true. That if I vote for the bad candidate and he gets elected, uh, the costs of that are distributed around at least my country and maybe the world. Uh, if I'm a judge and I make a decision that sets a bad precedent, I'll never know that it was a bad precedent. Uh, I'm imagining a precedent which changes the legal system just a little bit. And a very small change in the legal system might produce costs of, say, $100 million a year. Huge amount of damage for one person to, to make. There's a case I like to talk about where I think the court made a decision that a smart high school student should have been ashamed of, and it probably killed a few thousand people because it made it harder to bring out vaccines until, in that case, the legislature eventually reversed the court, in effect. Uh, so uh, most of the actors in the political market are taking actions where somebody else gets the benefit and someone else bears the cost. So they have no incentive to take the correct action and they very frequently don't. Uh, so the, sort of my standard example for that is a tariff where the industry that's being protected has an incentive to do something about it because it's sufficiently concentrated so that it can spend enough resources to actually affect whether the tariff gets passed. But the victims of the tariff who are all consumers of the goods and all producers of export goods, because we export less if we import less. Uh, those people are a very dispersed group. Individually, they, even if they had the information, they would realize that my attempt to get a politician to vote against the tariff has, you know, one chance in a hundred million of affecting anything. The tariff will only cost me three bucks anyway. Not worth doing. Uh, so in general, the political system is a system where market failure is the rule whereas the private market is one where it's the exception. It does happen. If I uh, start a fire in my fireplace and that makes the air a little bit smokier, uh, that is imposing costs on my neighbors, which I ignore. If I repaint my house in a really nice color scheme, that's providing benefits for my neighbors, which I mostly ignore. So those are cases in which I don't have quite the right incentive. I might not repaint the house when I should, and I might burn, burn, fire, burn wood in my fireplace when I should. But those are really the exceptions that most of the time in the private market, in order to use your resources, I need your consent. So I've got to offer you a price you're willing to accept. So that transfers the cost from you to me. If I want you to mow my lawn, I've got to pay you enough so you would rather mow my lawn than not. So I'm not imposing a cost on you. If I produce a book, 
I can sell it to people, and the people only get the book if they pay for it, so that means that the benefits get transferred to me. So roughly speaking, most decisions on the private market are ones where the individual bears about the net cost of his action, and the result is that mostly what's in my interest to do is in our interest for me to do. Uh, and in the political system, unfortunately, that's not true.